Welcome back to the Streets Talking Podcast. You're here with your boy Jesus again, man, for another special episode. Uh, today, you know, we 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 hitting home with it. We're staying in Augusta in our local area. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, something that should be near and dear to everybody's heart in the city. Um, the culture of black heritage in Augusta and the trickle down of that, the things that is left behind our ancestors who came before us, who paved the way for us to really enjoy some of the things that we really have in Augusta that to call our own. Um, so just to give you a background story, when I was in college, around I think 2017, I did an uh, internship with uh, the Lucy Craft Museum. Um, and one of the persons I work very closely with, directly with, uh, is Mr. Corey Rogers here. Uh, he is a historian of the Lucy Craft Landing Museum. And today, you know, we just came in here to get some backstory on some of the things and icons and figures in our Augusta area that everybody may not know or may not know a lot of information on. So I'm going to pass it to him and let him give his own introduction for a quick second to you guys. Okay, well, um, first of all, thanks, Demetrius, for inviting me out to be a part of this. Uh, I really uh, feel as though these types of outlets are very important to uh, getting the information out to the community about uh, our history and our culture. Um, but, um, you know, you mentioned that uh, at some point a few years ago, uh, you worked here with us at the Laney Museum, mm -hmm. and I've been with us now for about 18 years. Um, uh, Corey Rogers, a native of Augusta, Georgia, a graduate of Davidson uh, Fine Arts Magnet School, class of 92, um, went on to South Carolina State University after that, and then Georgia Southern for graduate school. And I've been here at the Laney Museum now since August of 2004. Mm. Um, our primary focus uh, at the Laney Museum is to look at the history of Augusta, um, seen through the focal point or seen through the lens of the black experience. Um, we look at, you know, various individuals that have had um, very amazing stories and narratives to talk about and to discuss. They shaped and changed this community in profound ways. Uh, obviously, the namesake of the museum, Lucy Craft Laney, uh, was this nationally renowned educator that um, people really um, have taken to because of what she stood for and what she represented, uh, excellence through education uh, and advancement through education. Uh, but our museum, we talk about a variety of other people and entities as well, and I'm pretty sure we'll get into many of those throughout the course of the podcast. Um, but um, yeah, thank you once again for inviting me out, thank you. Thank you. and uh, I look forward to uh, maybe talking about something that would interest your public. Oh yeah, most definitely. I, I believe a lot of my uh, viewing eyes have questions they may want to ask but don't know how to necessarily ask those questions you know so hopefully we're going to give them a, a insight today on just whatever their mind can wonder uh so i'll st we'll start it off with uh basically give us a understanding of how the lucy crab lady museum came to be and how it was acquired and uh those steps to, to make it what it is today okay so um lucy laney lived in the home that is now the Laney Museum. She lived in that residence until 1933. Uh, she was 79 years old uh, when she passed here in Augusta. And as I mentioned before, uh, at the time of her passing, Miss Laney's reputation had grown national, if some, some ways international. And um, she had this reputation for providing access to advancement through education. Education was the vehicle. So with Miss Laney's passing, there in rose a new crop of leaders within the African-American community. People like uh, Dr. T.W. Josie and uh, others, uh, Dr. Uh, Coach John M. Tutt, people like that. But one of those next generation leaders was Margaret Louise Laney. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the niece of Lucy Craft Laney. Uh, Margaret's father uh, was Dr. Frank Laney. He was one of Miss Laney's younger siblings, and he was a graduate of Howard University School of Medicine. So, came Miss Margaret came from a, a, a from good stock, uh, if you will. Margaret moved here to Augusta, uh, enrolled at Haynes, lived with her aunt Lucy, and after Miss Laney's passing, she became the interim principal of Haynes for about a year. Okay. Um, 
her her other career exploits included teaching at A.R. Johnson Junior High School, T.W. Josie High School. So this was in 1936, 30, the, Yeah, she would, it would have been 1934 when okay. she took over. And then after that one year, Reverend A.C. Griggs became the permanent principal from the duration of the 1930s until the school closed in 1949. But that being said, um, to, to the point of your question, Margaret lived in this home after she retired and she was through teaching and she did 17 years as a probation officer. Once she retired, you know, she settled here in the home. In 1986, the house caught on fire. Mm -hmm. um, she died in that house fire. But the connection between Margaret, family, and the museum lies in the vision of a sorority. So Delta Sigma Theta sorority purchased the property and it wasn't by chance. Margaret was a member of Delta Sigma Theta. Okay. And so they reached out to the family and asked for permission to purchase the property. The only caveat was that they would create a space that could tell the story of Miss Laney and other Augustans, but primarily Miss Laney. So as this sorority house began to develop in the late 80s and eventually opened as a museum and sorority house in 1991, they began to formulate a plan that would honor the legacy of Miss Laney. And in doing so, there a larger vision took root, which was a plan to honor the community around us. Um, and so that was sort of the formation of the Laney Museum of Black History. Um, the museum itself, um, you know, it's been around now since June of 1991. And its primary focus is to look at various pieces of Augusta history through the prism of the black experience. Mm -hmm. But it also still serves as a meeting place, not just for the Deltas, but for anyone in the community that needs a space for an event um, or for a function, uh, to have a meeting, we are much more than just a museum. We are a, a, a pillar in the community that allows the community to interact with its history and culture. Okay, yeah, most definitely. Um, when I did my small thing here, <laughs> uh, I was a part of the uh, summer camp, and mm -hmm. you know, it definitely was an eye opening experience to see kids coming out, you know, uh, doing the scavenger hunts, you know, reading some of the uh, readings we had. People coming in doing poems and paintings with them and everything, and just engaging with the museum and all. And you know, most young people may not know about the museum unless they went to Laney or maybe a church event or something of that nature. So I do want to let them know, like you said, it is more than just a museum or a house across the street from the school. You know, it's a hell of a strong access to the community with everything you said. Uh, so with with that, uh, with the museum becoming to light and showing. Uh, more than just Miss Laney, other Augustans throughout uh, history of Augusta. Uh, what about um, the golden blocks and those highlights of Augusta that we can talk about? Well, the term itself is a pretty unique term, mm -hmm. but the idea is not a unique idea. Um, as legal segregation began to take root in the early 20th century, Black America had to ask itself a question. Where do we go from here? There had been advancements made during the period of Reconstruction, during that post-bellum period of 20, 25 years after the Civil War. You started to see African Americans make advancements in education, for example. You started to see African Americans start their own businesses. Mm -hmm. You started to see land ownership take off. Uh, you started to see African Americans like uh, one of Miss Laney's classmates, um, Henry O. Flipper, uh, make advancements in the area of, mil of the military experience. So you saw a positive step being taken by this group of people that had only known almost degradation and second class citizenry for so many generations. But as legal segregation sort of crept in, uh, de facto segregation of the 1880s and early 90s, giving way to de jure 
segregation of the 1890s after various landmark Supreme Court cases, Plessy v. Ferguson, mm -hmm. Cumming versus Richmond County Board of Education. As these court cases codify segregation, black folk ask themselves, what are we to do? Where do we go from here? How do we survive in this apartheid state of America? And so in many of your black communities throughout the South, these neighborhoods were created. I think probably the most noticeable one, the one that most people talk about is the Greenwood community of right. Tulsa, yeah, Oklahoma. Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Well, as I just indicated to a group of young folk earlier this morning uh, at a talk I gave, um, Tulsa was not the exception. Tulsa, Black Wall Street was the rule. Mm -hmm. And it was the standard in black communities. Right. In Augusta, we didn't call ours Black Wall Street. We called it the Golden Blocks. And that was the loose term that referred to the area of Black Augusta from Twig Street mm -hmm. coming down Campbell all the way to Calhoun Street with the access point at Gwinnett. Now, what does that mean in today's terms? Campbell is James Brown Boulevard today. Calhoun is Walton Way. And Gwinnett is Laney Walker. So that area was a cluster of black owned businesses during the early 20th century. Any service that black folk needed was provided for them within their community. You had black funeral homes like W.H. Mays Mortuary, which was yes, founded yes. 100 years ago this year, 1922. Mm. You had the oldest black funeral home in Augusta, located not far from the Golden Blocks, F.M. Duga and Sons Funeral Home. You had Julia Dent yes. and all the work that she was doing with Dent's Undertaking Establishment. Uh, as far as banks were concerned, you had the Penny Savings and Loan Bank. Uh, as far as theaters were concerned, you had the Palace Theater, which was located further down um, Campbell Street, which eventually became the Red Star Cafe. But the most notable of all the entertainment centers for African Americans was the Lenox uh, Theater at mm -hmm. that time. Uh, you had uh, Dr. Burris had a sanitarium or hospital uh, at that corner. So you had all of these businesses, restaurants, Flourish. barbershops, beauty salons, and it became the backbone for upward mobility and success within the black community. Not only that, you had the oldest, the first insurance provider for African Americans in Georgia, mm -hmm. founded in 1898 by four teenagers and a formerly enslaved minister. That company started with $2.50 in 1898, would be worth over $8 million by 1952. And so that was the Pilgrim right. Health and Life Insurance Company. Um, Pilgrim started in Augusta at 1741 Milledgeville Road at the home of the Reverend Thomas Jefferson Hornsby, pastor of Antioch Baptist Church. Pilgrim at its height would encompass four major areas, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida always headquartered in Augusta, Georgia. So I say all that to say that the Golden Blocks was a representation of black entrepreneurship at the height of legal segregation. And one of the things that we have done at the, at the Laney Museum is partnered with Housing and Community Development and the Arts Council, the Great Augusta Arts Council, to create a series of public art works that mm -hmm. pay tribute to the Golden Blocks. Okay. And um, we currently have seven public art installations, two murals, and five gold, actual physical Golden Blocks on Laney Walker that tell the story of that period of black wealth and entrepreneurship at a time when blacks were seen as second class citizens. Right. Okay. Yeah, so. Most definitely, I remember I used to um, tell people about Pilgrim uh, Health and Life Insurance. Right down here, if you guys ever seen it uh, going down the road, it's the building on the left side of Tabernacle, right? If you're looking at the front. 
Yeah, so if you, well, actually, if you're looking at, if you're standing in front of Tabernacle, it'll mm -hmm. be over, to, yeah, it would be over to your right, okay, Tabernacle's right. left. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the corner of 12th and Laney Walker. Right, and it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a beautiful building. Um, there, I do have a picture, I think, um, when they were out there in the front, and they took a picture, uh, I think it was Hornsby and some of the other workers there. I might drop that in the files. Um, also, you talked about, uh, you brought it up, which I wanted to talk about for sure. Coming versus Richmond County Board of Education. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned, you know, um, those golden blocks were uh, sort of, I guess you can call it our sanctuary of culture and community. Um, right outside of those golden blocks, I don't think it was within, it was Ware High School, correct? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Ware. Downtown. Mm -hmm. And um, Ware High School, if I'm correct, was the first uh, black, all black school, high school in Richmond County. Well, actually, it was the first black high school in the state of Georgia okay. wow. for, for African Americans. And what's interesting about Ware is that, well, let me take one step back. What's interesting about public education for African Americans in the South, it was really African Americans that led the way in the South mm -hmm. in establishing public education. Northern states had had public education going back to the early 1800s. But in the South, there were no public schools established during the antebellum period. There are a lot of private institutions, right. but no public school apparatus, no school board, for example. So after the Civil War, it was really African Americans that led the way in establishing schools. And it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. For wealthy whites, you could easily send your kids to a private institution. Yeah, boarding school or something. Yeah, like you didn't have to worry about spending public funds on public school, particularly public high schools right. in particular. Uh, and, 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 you know, grammar schools provided a level of education, but for many, it wasn't enough. For some, they figured, you know, black folk didn't need but so much education anyway. Yeah, minimal. Yeah. yeah. And and across the board, there were a lot of Southerners, black or white, particularly white, that thought that even some white folks didn't need a certain level of education. So they were late to the game. Mm -hmm. We were ahead of the game. And as I said before, it makes sense. It makes sense because, as I always like to say, if you tell somebody, that they can't have something. Right. The first thing they want to do is to see yeah. what it is that you're trying to keep from me. Exactly. So when the Civil War ends, we've got the Reconstruction period, we've got the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and so the floodgates have opened. Mm -hmm. uh, as um, I often like to quote uh, Dr. Bobby Donaldson from USC Columbia, he talked about Reconstruction 1865 as everything being upside down. So the country was flipped on its head. Four million newly, and freed, newly freed enslaved persons clamoring for a new life. And so the one thing that was often outlawed and forbidden is the thing that African Americans gravitated towards education. Right. And so you have individuals like Henry McNeil Turner, you got individuals like William Jefferson White, um, Lucy Craft Laney, uh, Richard R. Wright, all of these individuals in the state of Georgia are now creating a network, creating a foundation that would allow for a natural pipeline, grammar school, high school, higher education, post-secondary colleges, all of these things are being created, not just in a private sphere, but also in a public sphere as well. So in 1880, where high school is created in Augusta, uh, as I mentioned before, it was the first public high school for African Americans in the state of Georgia. It was named for Edmund Asa Ware, who was president of Atlanta University. Okay. Oh, Clark Atlanta. And now today, Clark Atlanta yeah. University. Yeah. Okay. Richard Wright, the first principal of Ware, and Lucy Laney, who would eventually start Haynes, were classmates. They mm -hmm. knew each other at Atlanta University. 
As a matter of fact, I think this might be a good time to kind of kind of point out as an aside. That class that came through Atlanta University, Henry O. Flipper, first black to graduate from West Point, William Sanders Scarborough, noted linguist and classicist at um, Wilberforce College from Macon, Georgia, mm -hmm. Lucy Laney, founded Haynes Institute, Lamar School of Nursing, Bishop Flipper, Joseph Flipper, Henry's younger brother, prominent bishop in the AME Church, that's Flipper Temple AME in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Richard Wright, headmaster of Ware, first black president of Savannah State University. Okay. So these are some heavy hitters. Yeah. These were <clears throat> the movers and shakers and leaders in education and in the military and in religion in the late 19th, early 20th century. Ware was a proud moment for African Americans in Augusta. Mm -hmm. But what happened was, as the public school system began to develop in Augusta, many whites took issue with the amount of money being placed into Ware High School. Mm -hmm. And so instead of having an equal amount of money being distributed, it was very unequal. Black teachers were paid less than white teachers. They refused for many years to give Richard Wright an assistant. He was paid less than his counterpart at the white high schools in Augusta. And so black citizens eventually brought suit um, against the Board of Education. Um, that suit rolls all the way to the Supreme Court. Right, right. Uh, Cummings versus Richmond County Board of Education, they ruled unanimously in favor of the school board, mm -hmm. stipulating that the funds that they would allocate could be allocated at their discretion, yeah. and that it was a local matter that did not rise to the level of a federal statute. Mm. So by the Supreme Court ruling in favor of the Richmond County Board of Education, it further solidified de jure segregation because it then gave the local and state governments the, um, um, it gave them the opportunity to, see, do what to, to allocate funds yeah. wherever they want to allocate them. So um, you kind of see a disparity. You see where more money is being allocated for books and desks yeah. to Tudman. Yes. And other schools. So I was, I was going to ask that. So the schools that were around that wasn't uh, segregated at the time was Tubman. Was it ARC as well? You had Richmond Academy. You had Tubman. Mm -hmm. uh, those schools. What about uh, the school out there by the mill. That school. The school by the mill. Oh, yeah. the uh, Martha Lester uh -huh. school. Was that uh, open then? Now I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly when Martha Lester opened. And what was its what was its ethnic makeup? I'm gotcha. not quite sure. I can tell you this though, to that point about Martha Lester, Harrisburg was primarily a white community mm -hmm. at that time, and so I'm thinking that at a certain point it was an all white school, and then at a certain point it would integrate. Um, but the mill community, Harrisburg was primarily a community for white mill workers in the late 19th, early 20th century. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until more recent decades that it became an integrated community. Okay. Oh. So so most of the institutions over there were sort of centered around the white establishment or the white community in yeah. Harrisburg oh, okay. as well. But to get back to your point about uh, Cummings, Cummings, along with Plessy, those cases became precedent for the next 70 years of segregation, right. 70, 80 years. Brown v. Board would overturn many of those 1890 statutes and rulings, mm -hmm. but as you know, it would take another 25 years in many respects after Brown v. Board to, for Southern cities to desegregate. Yeah, with all deliberate speed. Exactly, yeah. and so, 
these southern mayors and these southern governors took their time and they put up roadblocks and it sort of led to the modern civil rights movement. That's vocabulary of the Dixiecrats, correct? Uh, yeah, Dixie yeah, you know, um, term that was uh, made popular by Strom Thurmond Thurman, yeah. and others, you know, who created the Dixiecrat Party. Mm -hmm. um, and and they, they the, the Democratic Party, they were the ones who put up that roadblock during the 20th century that stymied black progress when it came to education, voting rights, and many other things. And so, uh, so yeah, Cummings and Plessy were the precedent for segregation. Brown v. Board was the precedent that overturned it. Okay, yeah. So I guess just, just going out to tell people all the time, man, Augusta has so much, not even just the, the African-American culture, the black uh, city, of the city, but Augusta in general has a lot of footnotes in history where things maybe might have started here or something important happened here to lead to another historic event. So that's just why you got to know the background and the understanding of some things. Uh, so again, I want to go into maybe the underground what people don't know. Um, a lot of education or schools or things of that nature in the 19th and 20th centuries funded through religion or religious mm -hmm. outlets, right? So when we look at a uh, hanging institute, which was what Lucy uh, Laney High School was before, or if we look at um, tabernacle, tabernacle um, schools of that nature, the schools and religion groups had a lot of push and pull to be able to finance a school or be able to lend you land to build those schools on. Like you talked about in the reconstruction, you know, Freedmen's Bureau, or maybe just somebody who owned land in that community want to give a plot of land to these free uh, African Americans to start a church or start a school. And then most of the time that church turned out to be the schoolhouse as well. Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. uh, at this point I want you, I would like to ask you, how did the Presbyterian church play a role in Miss Laney's uh, path to open the Hay Institute? And how did other churches around the Augusta area provide those educational spotlights as well? Well, this kind of goes back to, um, the closing of Ware High School and a lot of a lot of what would happen in the early 20th century because it stems from that closing because there were those African Americans like Lucy Laney and C.T. Walker and Silas Floyd and uh, many others who felt as though there needed to be a uh, a competent um, there needed to be a, a solid foundation at the high school level for African Americans in Augusta um, there, there needed to be um, for many um, especially many whites in the Augusta area, um, the closure of where really was sort of like, you know, okay, th that's something that should happen so because they felt as though there shouldn't be a high school component in place that would educate African Americans in mass mm -hmm. at that level. Seventh, eighth grade education, okay. But ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth, you know, now we're starting to talk. We, we, now, we, we're starting to get ridiculous now that y'all are you're educating. All, yeah, exactly. And so you had white folks talking out against, you know, establishing these high schools. Mm -hmm. Where closes, Cummings makes sure that it stays closed. But now here's that question once again. What do we do in the face of legal segregation? And just as we talked about earlier in the segment with the Golden Blocks and the establishment of this business community, well, the businesses did not exist in a vacuum. These communities had everything. They had everything you needed for a community not just to survive from day to day, yeah. but also have a thriving, robust economy. Yeah. Longevity. You know, yeah, yeah, within. So you had, alongside these businesses, you had churches, at schools, at everything you can think of. And so as where closes and one opportunity shuts down, a brand new opportunity would open. And that would come in the form of the various religious denominations, Christian denominations that would start schools all over the country. You know, school uh, um, churches were doing this. Sometimes it would be an association Sometimes it would be a, a church denomination or a church congregation. Sometimes it would be an individual philanthropist mm -hmm. with a lot of with deep pockets. Um, or sometimes it would be a um, combination of all of the above. 
in Augusta, Georgia, um, it would take on various forms. For the Presbyterians, Miss Laney was able to start Haynes in 1883 and charter the school in 1886, name it after Miss Francine Haynes, who was a, a wealthy philanthropist, northern white philanthropist. So you had the Presbyterians sort of laying down a marker in Augusta with Haynes. The Baptists out in Burke County started the Walker Baptist Institute. This would have been Reverend C.T. Walker and his family. Eventually, in the 1890s, Walker Baptist would move to Augusta and um, take root in the Bethlehem community, uh, almost as a rival to Haynes in many respects. The Methodist, and this was a very unique situation, white Methodists of what is today the UMC, the United Methodist Church, mm -hmm. at that time, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, white Methodist and black Methodist of the newly created colored Methodist Episcopal Church, CMEs, mm -hmm. later changed in 1954 to the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. They formed a partnership that would create a Methodist educational program led by Reverend, later Bishop, Lucius Henry Holsey at Mother Trinity. This formation would lead to schools like Payne Institute. Okay. So Payne was created in 1882. Right. And then finally, the Catholic Church in the 19 teens they began to create an educational apparatus in Augusta. And the Franciscan nuns of the Catholic order, Catholic Church, along with the Franciscan the, nuns. Yeah, the, okay. the, the, the Franciscan sisters, they, they had been in Augusta for decades. And they were operating an orphanage mm -hmm. and a uh, convent on the corner of 12th and Gwinnett. Okay. As a matter of fact, the building is still there. You could see it standing on the corner next to the pilgrim insurance building mm -hmm. just look right across the street you'll see a three-story building that used to be um saint benedict the moor school orphanage and um and um um i was about to say nunnery but <laughs> yeah. um you know it was it was a a place uh for the uh, the catholic nuns that building and that endeavor would eventually lead to the formation of Immaculate Conception Academy wow. in Augusta okay. in 1913, um, 1914. A lot of people have been through that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 definitely. We used to joke that, you know, I grew up at Greater Mount Canaan Missionary Baptist Church in Sand Hills. And uh, we used to joke that uh, half of the Baptist children at Greater Mount Canaan, they went to school. At Immaculate Conception, yeah. so it was it was not unusual to see that yeah. um, Immaculate Conception would, like many of these other schools, even though we think of them as high schools, most of them were K through twelve. Right. Now Immaculate Conception would keep its high school up until the nineteen sixties, when Aquinas mm. integrated Immaculate Conception, dropped the nine through twelve, okay. and still to this day is K through eight. The point. These four institutions form the backbone of private high school education in Augusta. In Augusta. Okay. But it was so invaluable because between the closure of Ware in 1897 and the opening of A.R. Johnson in 1937, for those 40 years, there were no public high schools for African Americans in the city of right. Augusta. So the private schools had to step in and provide those services. Yeah. So so Haynes Institute for Lucy Crab Lane now was considered a private uh, school oh, then? Oh, it was most certainly private. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it didn't become Laney High School until 1949. Mm -hmm. It was a merger. A.R. Johnson closed in 49 and Haynes closed right. in 49. The Board of Education purchased the property and purchased the building, so it was once Haynes, and merged those two schools. So Laney High School is the product of Haynes, 
private school and Johnson Public School. Okay. And that's where Laney comes from. Oh, right. They right across from each other still to this day. Still to this day. Johnson would close for about three years and reopen around 1952 as what, what was then called a junior high school. Okay. So students at Johnson got eighth grade and ninth grade. Ken, uh, elementary school at that time was K through seven, hmm. and high school Laney was tenth, eleventh, and twelfth. So what was the primary school at? What was the primary school? When you say primary, what, the, what, the elementary school. E- elementary. Mm-hmm. So el- elementary schools, you would have had Silas Floyd, for example. Uh-huh. So Floyd School uh, was K through seven. Okay. And Floyd, the building is still there to this day. Is down. On the corner of 12th, I'm sorry, on the corner of 9th and Laney Walker, right behind the health department. Okay. That right. building there used to be Silas Floyd School. That doesn't have a marker yet? or is it- No, it doesn't have a state marker. And I'm not sure if it would, it's, it's tricky. Right. There's a possibility but I'm not sure if it would rise to that level of state okay. importance. Okay. Definitely yeah. local importance. Well, I'm just saying that because people don't know there is a Silas Floyd house. So I yeah, thought, you know, yeah, maybe yeah. If they, the house got a marker, maybe the school would have a marker. Yeah, well, and, and we had the Silas Floyd marker primarily because of who he was. Right. And okay. so that, that in and of itself had a lot to do um, with how we were able to get the marker and how important he was. But no doubt, the school itself also bears... Um, witness to his legacy as well. Mm-hmm. Um, just a little side note: uh, Florida is where James Brown went to school. Really? Yeah. So that's where okay. he went to school. Yeah. You ever read some of his uh, articles and, and, and interviews? He talks about Miss Laura Garvin. So okay. Miss Garvin uh, taught and at the Floyd School. Taught taught at Floyd it was School. K through seven. It was K K through okay. seven at the time, and you had other elementary schools at the time or primary schools. You had Hornsby. Right. Uh, down on the other end yeah. of Gwinnett. Was Hornsby a community school? Because the, the Hornsby community, was that the people who lived in that area went there? Well, primarily uh, the zone, not yeah. just the community, mm-hmm. but but that zoned area. Often people refer to that area as the bottom okay. and yeah. places like that. But, but, but the Hornsby subdivision, mm-hmm. along with that surrounding community, they would have fed into uh, Hornsby Elementary at mm-hmm. that time. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes sense. All right, so people out there, my educators, uh, my people who are uh, who love to rep their uh, LCL and their TW Josie and they Butler, you know, I, now y'all see some of the groundwork that those people came from. And like my brother here, who is an alumni of uh, AR Johnson, you know, now he has a little eye opening of some mm-hmm. of that stuff. Uh, so my next thing I would like to tackle is maybe you know, who are some um, icons in Augusta that people may not know of who don't get the proper do you know maybe you just want to touch on that for a second i'll give some people some points well well, it's interesting i've come across a lot of students in my years of teaching i've taught for 20 years at Payne college i I teach over at usc aiken now and um i've come across a lot of young folk that often will go into a building go to a school Mm -hmm. drive down a street (laughs) And for years, have no idea who the street is named for, why it's named for that person. Right. You know, so one of the more interesting things since Demetrius, you brought up, we've talked a lot about the school apparatus. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't we stick with that? No, do right next door to Miss Laney live John and Rosa Tut. Yes. So yes. your listeners may recognize John M. Tut Middle School. Mm-hmm. So Coach Tut worked at Haynes. Taught at Laney, uh, his wife worked at Haynes. Taught at Laney, um, he would become one of the legendary football coaches, uh, sports coaches, um, in Georgia. Inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame in yeah. 2007, uh, but John Tut, junior high and then later middle school, was named in his honor. Okay. Augustus R. Johnson. A.R. Johnson was one of the first black certified public school teachers in the post-Civil War era. Uh, He and other teachers like Ursula E. Collins, who worked with him, um, they both taught at the Maud Street Grammar School. Said over a thousand pupils at one point. 
that was in Augusta? Where is yeah. That location? So Mars Street is right behind A.R. Johnson. That's okay. Mars Street right there. Okay. Uh, M-A-U-G-E. Uh, some people may pronounce it differently than I do. <laughs> but okay. re- that street that runs behind A.R. Johnson, and it runs the length through uh, the Bethlehem community all the way down to uh, James Brown Boulevard, that street once had one of the largest primary schools. Mm. And Ursula Collins taught there. Uh, At one point, she was the assistant principal. A.R. Johnson taught there all the way up to his death Mm. in 1908. Um, Johnson was one of those movers in the community. He was the superintendent of Sunday schools at Harmony Baptist Church, alongside Reverend William J. White, the founder of Morehouse, who also founded Harmony in 1869. Um, so Johnson definitely is one of those persons, you know, worth mentioning. Thomas Walter Josie, Dr. T.W. Josie, he was a graduate of Haynes. Mm-hmm. Home, ma- homegrown. Yeah, homegrown. Homegrown. As a matter of fact, in three years, back to back at Haynes, Miss Laney would graduate S.S. Johnson, who would become a prominent physician, and businessmen, pharmacists, T.W. Josie, and John M. Tut. Mm-hmm. So back to back to back. They were classmates. They grew up together. Well, they grew up together, but one graduated in 1900, one in 1901, and one in 1902 well, from, okay. from Haynes. Wow. But then they would all come back to Augusta and give back to their community in different ways. Josie after graduating from Howard Medical School, opened a medical practice in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for about two years, and then came back to Augusta and opened a practice out of his home on um, near 11th and 11, near 11th Street. He then began to go to work for Pilgrim Insurance and rose through the ranks to become their vice president and medical chief medical director Mm. for Pilgrim. And when Pilgrim built their new office in 1916 on the corner of 12th and Gwinnett, Mm -hmm. that building that's now operated by Senator Charles Walker, former Senator Charles Walker, Walker the Walker Group, he had an office in there. C.T., I'm sorry, not C.T. Walker, but T.W. Josie would become known by many different names in the community. Uh, They called him the cause man, the man with the plan, but he was always leading something, always doing something. He would receive the Silver Eagle Award from the Boy Scouts. Uh, he was one of the co-founders of the Psi Omega chapter of Omega Psi Phi fraternity here in Augusta. Um, he was very active at both Mount Olive Baptist Church and at Tabernacle Baptist Church. He was also the medical examiner for all black schools during mm-hmm. segregation. Okay. So, in the 1960s, the Board of Education built a second high school for African Americans in Augusta on 15th Street, named it in his honor, Thomas Walter Josie High School. So, T.W. Josie, A.R. Johnson, John M. Tut, we have all these schools in Augusta named for prominent African Americans, and probably the one I didn't mention, and there are others, Peter H. Craig, um, I could have talked about, um, you know, Levi White, you know, we could have talked about Clara Jenkins, uh, I barely mentioned Ursula Collins, but the one person that I would be remiss if I did not mention him, his name is all over the city. All over. And on May 31st, 1976, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays came from Atlanta, Georgia to Augusta, and from the pulpit of Tabernacle, they rededicate the name of Gwinnett Street. After May 31st of 1976, there was no longer a Gwinnett Street in its original form. Mm -hmm. They would rename another street Gwinnett. But on that day, Gwinnett Street was named in honor of Lucy Craft Laney and the Reverend C.T. Walker. Thus, the name Laney Walker Boulevard. Reverend C.T. Walker, known to many as the Black Spurgeon for a variety of reasons, was probably, arguably, the most recognizable minister 
of the late 19th, early 20th century in the United States. Mm. Definitely in the state of Georgia. Probably the only other minister in Georgia that had the same resonance as Walker would have been Bishop Henry McNeil Turner okay. of the AME Church, uh, chaplain, officer during the Civil War. Um, you could probably argue that there are a few other ministers, but C.T. Walker had an international following, international profile. Uh, born enslaved near Hepsburg, Georgia, um, he would come to Augusta in the 1870s to go to the Augusta Institute, go to Morehouse. He uh, became pastor, different churches around the state, uh, pastored in LaGrange, Georgia for several years. He would come back to Augusta in the 1880s and he would become the pastor of Central African Baptist Church. This church would have been at the time located on the corner of 12th and Hopkins street that way. yeah right over right across okay. the street from where Silas Floyd would have lived okay where the Alpha House is today so the church had a split mm. there was an internal fight that ensued and two ministers one pulpit so Reverend Walker took his half of the church and they began meeting in different parts of the city and in August of 1885, they formed Beulah Baptist Church, which eventually became Tabernacle Baptist Church. Beulah was the original name of Tabernacle. Okay. Tabernacle was formed in the Fellowship Hall of a Union Baptist Church on Green Street. The first Tabernacle structure, the first building, was located closer to Ellis Street near the Springfield Village. Okay. And then in 1914, Reverend Walker executed what would become his grand vision. A procession from the chapel on the campus of, Le of Haynes Institute was led down to the corner of Harrison and Gwinnett, mm -hmm. today C.S. Hamilton Way and Laney Walker. And they laid the cornerstone for what will become the new tabernacle. It took seven years, March 1914 to 1921. The doors officially opened to tabernacle a month after C.T. Walker died in 1921 and then Reverend Floyd would take over as interim pastor for the next two years until he died in 1923. C.T. Walker in 1891 took an international trip to the Middle East. Three month trip. London, uh, Europe, the Middle East. This pilgrimage gained him international acclaim. Not only that, in 1899 he would leave Augusta and he would go to Harlem, New York for three years, mm -hmm. and he would preach at Mount Olivet Baptist Church in Harlem. That's where he would meet John D. Rockefeller. Uh -huh. So he meets Rockefeller um, in Harlem for the first time, but it wouldn't be the last time mm -hmm. because Rockefeller vacationed in Augusta. Really? And so Walker extended an invitation for Rockefeller to worship at Tabernacle. So we know of at least three separate occasions at the original church that the Rockefellers worshiped at Tabernacle. Really? President William Howard Taft visited Tabernacle on at least three separate occasions mm -hmm. as either President of the United States or Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, which he held after he left office as President. Booker T. Washington visited C.T. Walker here in Augusta. And on one occasion, in 1911, Booker T. was here for the dedication of Rockefeller Hall on the campus of the Walker Baptist Institute. Right. So the Rockefellers gave a sizable amount of money to Walker to build a dormitory mm -hmm. on the campus of Walker Baptist. And it was Booker T. Washington that gave the dedication speech for that building. You got Rockefeller money in Augusta. Okay. Got Rockefeller money. Got Taft, the president. Okay. You got Booker T. Washington, the de facto leader of the black community at that time, and then to kind of put the was, cherry. Was the ski open then? Oh yeah, almost, almost certainly. And as a matter of fact, I was just about to say, on the heels of 
Booker T. Washington come into Augusta in 1911. George Washington Carver mm. came here because he would give lectures at Walker Baptist okay. in the agricultural department, in the farming and agricultural department. So Booker T. would often come with George Washington Carver or they would come separately. But oh, no doubt, C.T. Walker was a part of that Tuskegee apparatus, okay. what people often refer to as the Tuskegee machine. And he was in Booker T. Washington's inner circle. No doubt. Really? No doubt. So C.T. Walker was this amazing orator, was this inspiration in terms of getting black folk to tap into that entrepreneurial spirit. T.W. Josie was this leader, this visionary, this healthcare provider. Tut was this mathematician who became a coach. A.R. Johnson was this individual who devoted his entire adult life to education. Lucy Craft Laney was the glue and the visionary that propelled the next generation of young female educational leaders and nurses. And nurses. Mary McLeod Bethune worked in Augusta with Miss Laney. So the blueprint was here in Augusta for these other schools. These are just some of the few, mm -hmm. but they are representative of the type of attitude that African Americans displayed despite segregation. They were determined to create agency for themselves and not be dictated to by white society. So much education. It's like everybody you just named either when you said they either went to the Hay Institute or had a tutelage under Miss Laney and created their own school or some form of educational process and it's just amazing to see all of that. Like you said, the blueprint was from uh, Augusta and you see footsteps throughout history of mm -hmm. uh, our stuff. So that we love now that people back then, they love too. I'll tell you, uh, Demetrius, um, if I had to give one example, if I had to give one example of a person who was educated in Augusta and was a representation of the quality of education, it would be Frank Garvin Yerby. Mm -hmm. Frank Yerby was born here in Augusta and is now buried in Madrid, Spain. He graduated in 1933 from Haynes, the same year that Miss Laney died. He graduated in 1937 from Payne College and 1938 from Fisk University with a master's degree. He then taught at Florida A&M and Southern University for short stints and did some doctoral work at the University of Chicago. During World War II, he worked at the Ford Motor Company and he worked in other in the plant industry um, as sort of like a quality control expert uh, during the war. But he also began writing short stories at that time. And so he writes this short story that wins the O'Henry Award. Mm -hmm. And from there, he's like, hmm, I kind of like this writing thing. See what I can do with it. So he's writing these different short stories, Health Card, which wins the O'Henry Award, The Homecoming, probably my favorite of his short stories, which involves a young black Southerner who goes off and fights in the Pacific during World War II. Mm -hmm. And when you meet the sergeant for the first time, he's on the train coming back to this small Southern town from the army during World War II. And when you meet him, the first question he has to himself, how can I go back to this town with a different attitude? Because he didn't have the same attitude after being all over the world and fighting for democracy and fighting against the Axis. Yeah. How, he's like, how can I go back? and be a second-class citizen. Which a lot of people experience. Exactly. A lot of people experience. So he goes back to the small southern town, and you can tell Frank Yerby's from Augusta because he would put Augusta landmarks into some of his stories. Yeah. 
So the Confederate monument uh, on Broad Street yeah, yeah. is the centerpiece of the town square in the homecoming. Mm. It's the centerpiece, the exact monument, we're, we're, we're word for up, word. We know today it's a subliminal. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so these short stories are amazing. Frank Yerby then decides to write a novel. And in 1946, he writes The Foxes of Harrow. It becomes an instant classic, instant bestseller. Sold over 2 million copies worldwide. 20th Century Fox pays him $150,000 to adapt the book into a movie. The book is then adapted into a movie the next year, 1947, with Rex Harrison starting, starring as Stephen Fox in the, um, in the production. It takes Frank Yerby to another level. During his lifetime, he wrote over 33 novels, sold 55 million copies worldwide, produced in 22 different languages, uh, and three of his books were adapted into movies. Mm. The Saracen's Blade, The Golden Hawk, and The Foxes of Harrow. In the 1950s, he moves to Spain and never comes back permanently to the United States. He is a classic example of the type of student that Miss Laney produced at her school. They were all destined for greatness because she demanded greatness. There you go, man. I, I don't understand how you can not say it plainly. Everything I've seen produced or Miss Laney put her hands on turn out to flourish and be beautiful, you know, and leave lifelong lasting things, you know, got all the schools around the city, you have the, they have Laney themselves, have the museum, and they're not even just in Augusta, there's schools outside of the state of Georgia named in her honor. Oh, definitely. You know? In Minnesota, yeah. you got the Lucy Laney K-5 through school. Right. At Lincoln University, you have the Lucy Laney dormitory. Uh, so, yeah, you have a uh, school. State capital. Yeah, uh, you, you, yeah, you got the portrait in the state capitol dedicated in 1974 by then Governor, future President uh, Jimmy Carter. So uh, Miss Laney's legacy endures. Um, I think it's now up to us as educators, as historians, uh, as uh, college professors, as public historians, to now build upon that legacy and take it to another level. People know of Miss Laney, but they don't know Miss exactly. Laney. And so I think now it's time for us to really take her legacy and share that wealth with others outside of just our little circles of influence. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, man, let, you heard it here first, and let's pay some of these bills, man. So uh, I know, maybe not everybody know, but now they will know that there is some construction going on and some renovations going on inside the home of Miss Laney and the, what is now the museum. Uh, so let the people know, you know, springtime coming up, you about to have uh, the masters and spring break, you about to have summer break, things like that, family coming to town. So how can my audience and whoever get in touch with the museum when it's opening day? What are some exhibits that are permanent in there right now? What are some that's gonna be coming? Uh, what do people have to look forward to? Okay, so you can keep up with our uh, comings and goings and information about the Laney Museum through our website, uh, LucyCraftLaneyMuseum.com. We also have a very robust profile on Facebook. So if you um, just do a quick search on Facebook of our uh, page, it'll pull up all current information and sort of anything that's happening in real time uh, at the Laney Museum. We're excited about a couple things, Demetrius. Uh, when we open back up in early March, and, and we'll be open in the next couple of weeks, um, we have a new exhibit coming up. Um, our quilting exhibit is an old exhibit, but mm -hmm. the type of quilts, brand mm -hmm. new. So we'll be doing a quilting exhibit that will pay tribute to historically black colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. And we'll have different quilts that will represent different HBCUs. Um, the first quilt that came to me, because I asked the quilters if they could send me some images, the very first quilt they sent, and I was a little jealous because I went to South Carolina State, uh -huh. and I love the South Carolina State quilt, the one they did for State, no doubt. I, I think that's a great one. But the Florida A&M quilt, I was a little jealous. Yes, because what they did was, whoever did the quilt, and I can't recall all the names of all of the quilters right now. There are multiple quilters. She did a vertical quilt green and orange colors with a drum major high-stepping mm. in the middle of the quilt to oh, represent good. the marching 100. Oh, 
gotta see yeah, that. it's I a it's this. amazing. I, I will email you that photo. It's amazing. So we currently have quilts of Hampton, Howard, Spelman, yeah. Albany State, South Carolina State, Florida A and M, uh, Morehouse College, and we've got a few more quilts. Claflin is on its way. Um, we've got uh, Morris Brown. Uh, we've got Fort Valley, uh, and so it's a two-year project. Where after the two years, we, we hope ain't got no pain. We got no pain. We got well, pain. Okay, pain we college. Pain, pain college course. coming. Yeah, yeah. But but to my point, it's a two-year project that will allow us to create between twenty-four to thirty brand new quilts mm. uh, okay. of different HBCUs, and of course, Pain College. Uh, will be one of them, and some of these quilts will be for sale. Okay. So we'll let auction them. or just straight up. Well, we're hoping. Well, that's something we'll have to determine because okay. initially we were going to auction the pain quilt and then give the proceeds over to the institution, mm -hmm. but the preview images have generated such a response that uh, we'll either auction them off or they'll just be up for sale, just just right. in general, just a, a one price. And, uh, but we'll see how that goes. Okay. The other thing I'll just quickly mention, we have our golf tournament coming up since you mentioned the Masters. So in May, we will have our annual golf tournament and uh, or April and May. And um, for more information about the golf tournament, all you'll have to do, well, the golf tournament will be in, yeah, in May. All you have to do is just uh, call us here at the museum at 724-0503. Five, wait a minute. <laughs> I, you know what? I forgot the number to the museum because I never have to call it and everything. I'll I, put all the contact. Yeah, yeah. I, I tell right. you what. I tell you what. The best thing would be just to check our website and we'll okay. put up the most, um, uh, the most current information about the golf tournament as well gotcha. to your public. That's my bad. <laughs> you know. You know. See, Demetrius is 22 years old. I'm 62 years old okay. and everything. So I'm getting old, public. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. Um, but yeah, you can call 404-488-3209. Um, and Mr. Leon Mabin will allow, that will Maybe. allow, yeah, Mr. Mabin, who's our vice president, um, he can definitely uh, sign you up. Is right. either as an individual or as a I, team. I got a, I got a couple partners that think they can do something on that green. We might have to get out there and yeah. start swinging some clubs. Okay, okay. That's, that's dope, that's dope. Anything else? Well, you know, I, I think that's about it, uh, D. You know, right. uh, we covered a lot of ground today. Sure. But yeah, um, when the museum come back open, I would love to come back. Yeah, you know, yeah. Showcase some of those exhibits, you know, get the people out here. Yeah, for sure. And green for that. sure, yeah. Love, love to have you down and y'all come on out. Uh, the museum always has something for everyone. And we'd love to tell you a little bit about the richness of Augusta's black culture. Hey, there it is. All right, man. Appreciate y'all for tuning in today, man. Always remember, your streets is talking. Pull up on Lucy Crab Lane Museum. You know where it's at. You've seen it a thousand times. Maybe not. Have known what was actually in there. So come on down. Bring your kids. Bring your mama. Bring your grandma. I don't care. Just come on out. Speak to Mr. Rogers. And do your just do it. All right. Peace. All right. That is. Yeah.